All right, go ahead. I'm going to pass it to you, Nadine. Well, thank you. Well, hello and welcome. My name is Nadine. I'm an AARP volunteer in Juneau. On behalf of AARP Alaska, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth in a five-part fall harvest series with the Alaska Cooperative Extension Service. Today, Sarah Lewis of the Cooperative Extension Service will be teaching us how to preserve, pickle, and ferment vegetables. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have some Zoom meeting tips. So please know that on the left is the mute button. We ask everyone to put the microphone on mute to prevent background noise. You can tell it's on mute if there's a red line through it. If it doesn't, just click the microphone to mute it and unclick when you want to talk. The third button from the right is the chat. To submit something in chat after you've typed it, hit the enter button. You can use this to type your questions in the chat. The last button on the right is the reactions button. If you click on this, it will show you several options, including a hand. If you want to ask a question verbally, just click on the hand button and we will call on you. Other technical detail, uh, we are recording this program and we'll send out the recording and all the links from the chat after the program. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization for people over the age of 50. We have 38 million members nationally and 77,000 members in Alaska. AARP's purpose is to empower people to choose how they live as they age, save for retirement, stay healthy and fit, build strong relationships and have meaningful activity. So AARP Alaska is working on aging issues for Alaskans over the age of 50. We do this through advocacy, working on national issues like social security, Medicare, and prescription drugs. At the state level, we're advocating for telehealth, a sustainable state budget, senior grant programs, and healthcare. Education, brain health, technology use, veteran services, gardening, fraud prevention, caregiving resources, and financial planning. Member engagement, social groups, movies, guest lectures, exercise groups, and many more, <clears throat> and community action. We have local teams in Juneau, Ketchikan, Anchorage, Matsu, and Fairbanks working to make their communities age more friendly. The Fall Harvest Series, uh, Preserving Herbs, I believe we saw that last week. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to change that slide. <laughs> Okay, well, this week we have Sarah and she will provide us a wealth of information regarding pickling and we will be back with you a little later. So Sarah, to you. Thank you very much, Nadine. Oh, it's a very old picture of me, but yes, that was me <laughs> before I came to my senses and cut all that hair off. So um, thank you so much for inviting me back again this week. Um, I did, as you saw last week, I did the um, preserving herbs and uh, apologize. I'm just going to close down a few things so I can see stuff. So um, <clears throat> this week, what I'm doing is it's a class that I call pickling and fermenting. Um, so pickling actually is a sort of a generic term. It's when you acidify something, when you raise the acidity level in something for some reason. You can do that for with lots of different things, vegetables, obviously we're talking about today, but you can pickle wood, you can, um, you know, you can pickle meat, you, but what you're doing in all of these situations is you are raising the acidity so that you are making the environment around, in this case, food, around that food less inviting to um, unhelpful, more um, microorganisms, bacteria, yeast, moles. We're raising the acidity to preserve the food for longer. So, um, so that's what pickling is. Fermenting is actually a kind of pickling. So, um, so that's people sometimes get confused, especially here in America. We often, when we hear pickle, we think pickled cucumber and we think store-bought flavor of pickled cucumber. 
but you can have, as most of you know, but you might not have called them pickles, um, pickled carrots, pickled asparagus, pickled uh, Brussels sprouts, um, sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is a pickle. Kimchi is a pickle because using the fermentation process, we have acidified those vegetables. So, um, so yes, yeah, so what you're doing is you are raising the acidity and, um, and then also when you are, um, there's two ways to pickle that I'll talk about in just a second. So there's, uh, you can raise the acidity with vinegar or you can raise the acidity by creating an acid, a lactic acid, which is kind of like a homemade vinegar. Um, so you can do, you can make pickles in those two different ways. So, um, and why you're doing this, again, I'll be talking about the two different types of pickling. And there, there are sometimes slight, other than the food preservation, there are some different reasons why you might choose vinegar pickling as opposed to fermentation pickling. And I'll talk about those differences and why you might choose one or the other and the pros or, and cons. So first I'm gonna share my screen. And actually first, I apologize, hang tight. I'm gonna find the correct, there we go. All right, I hope everyone can see this. Uh, a quick housekeeping thing, if if you can't hear me, if, um, if you have a time sensitive question, like I didn't hear what you just said or repeat that, Feel free to um, unmute yourself to ask me that. Also feel free to put questions in chat. I'm not monitoring chat, but I do monitor the little, the little red number. So I do see when questions perhaps have come in and I will periodically stop and answer those questions. So feel free to do both of those things. So two ways to pickle and preserve. So on the left, you see I have these stages and both types of pickling go through the same stages. It's just there's different things happening those in those stages, and we at home may or may not be involved with some of those stages. So I'm going to talk about lactofermentation first. So the fermentation stage in lactofermentation is you are adding a salt or a salt brine to the vegetables that you're going to pickle. That's and you're and then you're literally just letting it go. Time actually moves you to the second stage, which is the pickling and acidifying by just putting those vegetables in a salt or a salt brine. You are uh, creating an environment that uh, one, there are already bacteria on the vegetables and in the air around, but creating the salty environment makes it so that's an environment that you're, you're kind of editing the guest list. You're creating the environment that those specific bacteria like, and they start to grow and other bacteria don't like that. Um, and so they really do start to take over. And what they do is in the pickling and acidifying stage, the lactobacillus and other uh, probiotics, I'll talk about probiotics in a bit, they actually create acid. So as they are uh, basically digesting, um, you know, living with our vegetables, they create lactic acid. And what you have at the end of that is pickles with probiotics. Now, uh, now I'll go through the, the, the first two stages for vinegar pickles. So the first stage in vinegar pickles typically is not done in our homes. That is done usually in a factory that is making vinegar. They are taking a, a fruit or a grain and they are fermenting it to create uh, acetic acid. And so in the pickling and acidifying phase, vinegar is the acid that is replacing, basically replacing just the straight water in your vegetables. It's replacing minerals and things. It's, it's getting soaked into your vegetables. It's surrounding your vegetables. Uh, and the high acid of the vinegar is what preserves those vegetables. Now, the important difference between those is you just, at the end of that, you just have pickles. 
hurrah, you have wonderful, delicious pickles, but you don't have probiotics. The fermentation process that you do in your home is the only one that will result in probiotics. So you end up with kind of two different products, but both are high acid foods. Um, and then you, when you're looking at the preservation of whatever type of pickles you have made, for lacto-fermented pickles, the short-term preservation is refrigeration. Actually, for both of them, short-term refrigeration or short-term preservation. And that's when I say short-term, one to six months. And, and sometimes we've probably all experienced some type of pickle in our refrigerator that we open up or we, you know, some more than six months later, or we don't even remember, but we open it up and they're still perfectly fine. Um, but definitely for the higher quality, one to six months uh, as refrigeration will preserve those pickles because of their high acidity. The high acidity and the low temperature are what are uh, preserving those at that point. The low temperature makes the any microorganisms, whether it's yeast, molds, or bacteria, slows them way down. Refrigeration does not kill them, but it does slow them way down. And then with the high acidity, that's what makes them last a lot longer in the fridge than if you just had your asparagus sitting in the fridge. We all know, we've all experienced the slimy asparagus after, you know, what, a week or whatever. Whereas pickled asparagus, you can keep for a good long time. Long-term preservation though, you want to think a little bit more about that based on what type of pickle you have. If you uh, have a lacto-fermented pickle and you want those probiotics, there are really good reasons for having probiotics in our diets. We have a lot more research now about how they're helping with our gut health, mental health, urinary tract health, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so if you want to keep those probiotics, you want to stop there at that refrigeration. You don't want to do a long-term preservation method. But if the probiotics aren't the end goal, uh, if it's the nutrition and the taste and the preserving a vegetable that you really like, you can actually potentially water bath can. So that is pasteurizing in jars those pickles for a certain amount of time at boiling water temperature. And what that does is it kills any of the microorganisms that are in there, the yeast, the molds, the bacteria. So of course you can see why you wouldn't want to do that if you wanted the probiotics, because you're killing them when you pasteurize them. That's part of the goal of pasteurization. So long-term preservation doing water bath canning, the pros for it is that you preserve your flavor and your nutrition, but the con is that you lose those probiotics from your lacto-fermented pickles. But uh, vinegar pickles, you're not worried about killing the probiotics. You just want to pasteurize it for long-term shelf storage. Uh, pasteurizing at water bath temperatures is a great way to go. Um, and But what we do recommend is that you use a USDA or extension tested recipe before you uh, process those in water bath canning, because what you're doing, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, what you're doing is you are taking a low acid food, most vegetables are low acid food, and you are acidifying it. And if you don't acidify it enough, water bath canning pasteurization may not be adequate to kill the bacteria that are in that product. Low acid foods, you need to pressure can to kill the bacteria. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So if you're going to be doing water bath canning of your vinegar pickles, do use USDA extension tested recipe for safety. All right, so I'm actually going to talk a little bit about canning uh, for those who are interested in perhaps, you know, doing the vinegar pickles and then canning them up. As I mentioned, step one is preparing a tested recipe. Uh, step two is packing your jars. I'll talk about these uh, with some 
I'll show you some things that I have here in the kitchen in a second. Step three is the pasteurization process. That's the water bath canning. And then step four is making sure that those jars sealed before you go ahead and store them in the pantry. So I'm going to Stop sharing. So step one, using a tested recipe. The best places to get a tested recipe are from, um, and, and I will include some of these resources in what I sent to Teresa um, to uh, send out to all of you because I've got lots of potential resources for you. And so an email would be best rather than putting them here in the, in the Zoom. So um, there's a great online resource through the National Center for Home Food Preservation. That's with the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension. Associated with that website is actually a book, a really great, I call it the Food Preservation Bible. It's called So Easy to Preserve. You can purchase that for I believe it's $25 now from any cooperative extension office. So um, if you have any questions about a, an extension office near you, you can put that in the chat and I can uh, let you know more about that. Um, so that's a great book. The website and the book have the same information. Uh, it's just some people, sometimes it's nice to have it in book form but you can get it for free on the website. Another good resource for tested pickle recipes is actually Ball. Um, so they have both online and books as well. And, um, but if you're going to be using basically any cookbook for canning, any pickle and any pickle recipes, you wanna know that they're relatively recent. We get, we have a lot of uh, miscellaneous canning recipes that are floating around in our kitchens, um, in family kitchens. And of course, online is just, yeah, it's a, it's a whole other universe of potential recipes out there. You want to make sure that it is a relatively current recipe to know that it is, is actually following current tested recipes. And when I say current, I mean within the last decade or so. So if you find a book that, you know, is 20, 30 years old, that happens pretty regularly. Uh, if you don't necessarily want to buy a current version or get rid of that book, just you can look online and you compare it to the tested recipes that are available currently, uh, especially at that National Center for Home Food Preservation. So that's a great resource for checking that you're using a tested recipe for pickling. Um, so uh, other good sources, I think, um, if you are just sort of randomly looking online for a tested recipe and say you have a recipe that was handed down to you or you have a, a friend or a family member who had a pickle that you loved and you want to recreate it, you can get that recipe and then you can Google, you know, home canned uh, pickled uh, zucchini. And then at the end of it, put either USDA or extension. And the reason you do that is because if you do that, you will get results that are from either the USDA, the National Center for Home Food Preservation, or some extension office throughout the United States and the territories. Um, because we only put out tested recipes, the recipes. And when I say tested, I actually mean scientifically tested. So those recipes have been tested to know that that product, uh, has been heated high enough for long enough all the way through to kill whatever microorganisms you're trying to kill. And typically that's pretty much everything, uh, yeast molds and bacteria, but that's what they're actually testing for. They aren't necessarily testing for taste, but if it tastes terrible, usually there's not a recommended tested recipe for it. Um, so, uh, so if you find a tested recipe through USDA, National Center Home Food Preservation or Extension, what you can do with those recipes is you can compare the recipe that you have that you're doing research on to the tested recipe. You wanna take a look at the vinegar, the salt and the water. Those are the big three. Some recipes won't have any water. Some won't have any salt. Some might be just all vinegar and spices. Some might be a mix of water and vinegar and salt and spices. But the main thing is the vinegar, the water, and the salt. You want those to stay the same ratio. You can increase or you can decrease, but you want them to stay the same ratio. Other than that, 
that, all of those spices, you can change them. So if you have, someone gave you a recipe for, you know, canned zucchini or some uh, pickled zucchini that has turmeric in it or um, uh, some other herb uh, that isn't listed on the tested recipe, go ahead and as long as you're keeping the, the acid level um, correct in the brine, the vinegar, the water, the salt, you can change all those other spices. So that's one way that you can either um, customize your own pickles or check to make sure that you are, that someone else's recipe is actually safe to can. But if you can't find um, a tested recipe for the pickle that you're looking for, or you try the tested recipe and it's too acidic for you, or perhaps too sweet or whatever it might be, when in doubt, refrigerate. You can refrigerate your pickles. So this right here, for example, is um, some cauliflower pickles that I made. I didn't wanna make a huge batch that I would then can up. I just wanted some cauliflower pickles that we'll eat over the next little bit. And so I, since I'm not canning it up, um, I, I think I did use a tested recipe just because it was easy, but I could have reduced the vinegar a bit if it was too acidic. Um, I, in this particular recipe, I don't know if you can see that it's kind of yellow. That's not my camera. There's actually turmeric in this, which made it a really pretty yellow color. And um, so this has just been refrigerated. So I think I made these probably two months ago. No, not that much. We haven't eaten that much. So meh, within the last month or so. And, um, and so we just eat on this periodically. We just pull it out. And, and I also include uh, my pickles in recipes. So that's another thing that you can do is they don't just have to be a condiment. You can actually chop them up and put them in recipes. Um, they will give you know different flavors to different soups. And if you put them in with uh, you know pot roast or something like that, they will make different flavors. So use your pickles in recipes as well, especially if you if you experiment a lot and you've got a lot of pickles and you're trying to figure out what to use them for quickly, go ahead and use them in recipes. But let me go ahead and check chat really quickly. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit more about canning right now and why it is important to uh, find a tested recipe and if you're going to can it, to uh, water bath can it. So this scale, this is a pH scale. So zero is at the top, that's strong acid. 14 is at the bottom, that's a strong alkali. You'll notice though that neutral is actually here. Seven is neutral. Um, and really most of what we're seeing on this scale is acidic because almost everything we eat is acidic. Um, so what we have to do then is we differentiate foods as high acid or low acid. And there's an important cutoff line. So the cutoff line is right here at about 4.6. And you'll notice, just put a pin in this idea that that 4.6 is right next to this little bacteria word right there, that little pesky bacteria there. So naturally high acid foods are most fruit, not all fruit, but most fruit, all of our wild berries, and there's one vegetable that is naturally high acid that's important to Alaskans and that's rhubarb. There might be some other vegetables that are naturally high acid as well, but rhubarb is definitely one that we like to know about. So most fruit, um, all of our wild berries and rhubarb, those are naturally high acid foods. You do not need to add an acid to those. You don't need to pickle those for them to be high acid. Um, a second category that's technically in the high acid foods category, but it's, it's a fruit. But as we kind of know, tomatoes and zucchini and cucumbers, those are all technically fruit, but really they behave a lot like vegetables. So tomatoes are right on the edge of being a high acid food. And 
Even one variety of tomatoes can have lots of variability in its pH because of breeding and how we've bred them for taste and things. So tomatoes are actually right on the edge. So we have them in their own little category. We don't technically pickle tomatoes to make them high acid, but most tomato recipes that you see for canning will have uh, some uh, small amount of acid added to it just to boost it up so that you know those it's consistent consistently high acid so that's the second category in the high acid uh, group naturally low acid foods are almost all vegetables a couple of fruit that i talked about and all meats all animal products whether that's terrestrial or marine all animal products and again, on vegetables, that's also terrestrial or marine. Uh, so that could be, you know, seaweed, that could be uh, beach greens, that could be the vegetables that you're growing in your garden. So those are naturally low acid foods. Then the fourth category, which is what we're talking about right now, is low acid vegetables that are being acidified. We're adding or creating acid and we're turning them into a high acid food. And so that's why when I mention a tested recipe, you want to know, for example, that your asparagus, which is kind of middle of the range of low acid, you wanna know that you're adding enough acid to it that it bumps up to the high acid category if you're going to process it in a water bath canner for the shelf. If you don't know that your asparagus recipe has enough acid in it, then you refrigerate it. Um, because if you look over at the left side of this um, scale, you see these three friends of ours, potentially friends, potentially helpful, potentially not helpful, molds, yeasts, and bacteria. If you have a high acid food, uh, the, the microorganisms that you're most concerned about are molds and yeasts. So that's why, you know, fruit molds, we're not as, you know, so we leave, even leave fruit out on the counter. Uh, we don't necessarily refrigerate it. Some fruit you don't want to refrigerate. Um, and that's because we're, what's going to happen is it's going to mold or it's going to ferment. We can taste that. We can see that. We know that's happening. And molds and yeasts are not uniformly dangerous to humans. There are folks who are allergic, who have sensitivities. There are situations, very specific situations, where molds and yeasts could potentially be harmful to someone, but typically people know that or they know you want to know who you're preparing it for um, to know that those are going to be just fine. But they're not universally harmful. But you get down into bacteria, and there are bacteria that are universally harmful to us. E. coli, salmonella, listeria, and ones that we really want to do whatever we can to not invite into our food. So, and uh, 4.6, as I mentioned, a pH of 4.6, when you get a higher pH than that, I know it's going down, that's confusing, but you get a lower acid, which means a higher pH, then you have the possibility of bacteria moving in. And a lot of those bacteria, again, are just going to be spoilage bacteria. That's why, you know, our, and a lot, and they will also be yeasts and molds will typically move in, you know, sooner even. But, um, but like the asparagus, when it starts to go slimy uh, in the refrigerator, that might be yeasts, molds, and bacteria that are doing that, uh, spoiling that food. Now, the reason when we talk about canning that this line is super important, there is one specific bacteria that likes to be in a low oxygen, low acid environment. So, um, so if you are going to can something in a jar or in a can, but most people do it in jars nowadays, I know it's confusing the canning terminology that we now do it pretty much exclusively in jars at home. Um, so if you if you want it to be shelf stable in a jar, you're actually creating a low oxygen environment. That's part of the pasteurization process. The jar will actually release some of its air. And then when it cools, 
it will um, actually, that's how you get the vacuum seal on that lid. It's actually part of the process of canning that you are reducing the oxygen in that jar. So when you're putting something in a jar and if it is high acid, all you need to do is kill molds and yeasts. That's all you're worried about. Molds and yeasts, if you're going to pasteurize them in a jar, can be killed at boiling water temperature. So that's 212 degrees. Uh, you still do want to follow a tested recipe uh, so that you, you know, know how long you need to process it for. So for example, uh, there are lots of pickles that are only 15 minutes, but I think pickled beets might be up at 40 or 45 minutes. There are some things that are just longer and that has to do with the density of that vegetable and sort of the, the chemistry of the product. So you do still want to, if you're making a pickle and you know that it's got you know super high acid, you still do want to follow that recipe for how long you process it. But if you process it for the recommended amount of time, you will kill the molds and the yeasts that are in that product. Now, if you are going to can something that is low acid, and so I mentioned the naturally low acid foods are some fruits, and that would be your zucchini, your um, even cucumbers, though we don't typically just sort of can those, we usually pickle those. Um, but then you can see also on the li this list, you've got your okra, your carrots, et cetera, uh, seaweed, bull kelp. Those are all low acid vegetables. So if you were going to can those or any animal product on its own without pickling it, um, you are creating, you've got a low acid food in a low oxygen jar environment. The bacteria that likes that is called Clostridium botulinum. You might have heard of botulism poisoning. That is what results from having Clostridium botulinum living in a low oxygen environment. So the problem is that Clostridium botulinum spores are not killed at boiling water temperatures. It doesn't matter how long you boil something, it won't uh, boil at higher than 212 degrees. And it doesn't matter how long you boil a botulism spore, or something that is containing botulism spores, you will not kill them. It doesn't matter if you do it for eight hours, 12 hours, it's not going to kill them at 212. The only way that you can uh, kill botulism spores is at 240 degrees. And the only way to do that is in a pressure canner. That will, uh, uh, the adding pressure allows that water to boil at a higher temperature. And that 240 degrees is what you need to kill the botulism spores. So that's why you want to know if you are pickling a vegetable, you want to know that you're acidifying it enough so that it is um, a, truly a high acid food, especially if you want to can it in jars. If you don't want to can it in jars or you don't know that it's safe, refrigerate it. So that's the little safety bit about canning. Let me see, there's another chat. Let me take a look. Oh, salmon, all, all marine, all animals and animal products are all low acid foods. They will all be even lower than most of those vegetables that were on that list. So um, yeah, so that includes uh, wild game, salmon, uh, all of those things, all low acid foods, uh, dairy, even dairy is, is going to be a low acid food. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit more about fermented pickles, but I'm going to do it while demonstrating because I kind of like people to see how crazy easy, how crazy easy it is to ferment vegetables. And it's very, very safe um, because you are, as I mentioned before, you are creating a very salty environment that is um, uh, not friendly, you know, it's not where a lot of microorganisms are going to want to move into, uh, but there are some specific microorganisms that over the millennia, over evolution, et cetera, have actually evolved with us. They like room temperature. They like similar vegetables that we like. And it turns out that we actually like 
the taste of what they do to our vegetables. So that's one of the reasons that I really like teaching about fermented vegetables because it is one of the oldest and most universal, most globe-wide uh, food preservation method that pretty much, every, well, not pretty much, every continent, almost every culture, there are very few cultures that through history didn't have some kind of fermentation of some sort. Um, a couple months ago, I was teaching in a, in a local community and there were some folks who were from the Southwest and they were uh, from an indigenous tribe in the Southwest. And they said, nope, 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 we don't have any because they were only thinking about pickles. They were only thinking about, you know, the acidified vegetables. But even, but then we went online, we're like, well, let's go check this out. We went online and yes, indeed, there was um, fermentation of corn, not necessarily for, you know, alcohol, but what, what happens when you ferment things and culture things, it just like what's happening during the fermentation for our pickles, it's kind of pre-digesting that, that food. And there will be a result that could potentially be either very tasty or very healthy or helpful. Um, so yes, so fermentation has been going on for a long, long time. Here in Alaska, as in lots of more Northern cultures throughout the world that have lots of seafood products, there has been, of course, lots of uh, fermentation of um, fish products, for example, down here in Southeast, we've got ink and cock, which are both uh, fermented fish products um, that are traditional foods. Uh, but of course, you can also think about kimchi, um, uh, soy products. So uh, fermentation, uh, tofu is a fermented soy product. So um, lots and lots of products have been fermented because it's been very helpful to us. So fermented vegetables, um, you know, have the test of time for sure. And so what I've got here is I have um, some asparagus. I really like to uh, do fermented pickles of asparagus. I tend to, especially if you're starting out, focus on one vegetable. Don't do mixes right away. Often in these classes, I'm like, just mix up your vegetables and you can go ahead and do that. But sometimes you can get flavors that you don't expect. And so if you're kind of starting out, it's not a bad idea to do single vegetable. And then kind of uh, as you become more comfortable and understand the process, what's gonna happen, it's more predictable to you. Try mixing, literally mixing it up a little bit. Some of the mixes that I have liked are cauliflower, onion, uh, red pepper, and garlic. Those are nice together. Um, green beans, uh, pretty much you'll hear me say onions or garlic. Those tend to ferment well with and give nice flavors to other vegetables. Whereas sometimes like your cauliflower um, or your Brussels sprouts, as we know that those, those tend to be a little bit more bitter vegetables or they have a they have a certain bitter taste to them and they can actually give that to another vegetable that you are fermenting with them. And that may turn out great or it might not turn out how you were wanting or you just might not like the flavor. So start with a single vegetable. I've got some asparagus here. These have been washed. What I also have, um, I do my fermenting in just quart size, relatively small. I tend not to do really big batches. Partly because I'm not in a place uh, geographically in Southeast where I can get, you know, bushels and bushels of one particular uh, vegetable that I need to deal with right away. I don't have my own garden. So I'm, I'm typically buying things in relatively small batches, even if they're local. So I do small batches of pickles. Also, it's easy to sort of do the fermentation cycle from the counter to the fridge starting again, you know, and, and they fit in the refrigerator. So I like quart size. So what I have here is just um, a quart of tap water. Now, uh, there are some folks who will recommend that you start with purified water. Um, I never do. Uh, yes, there is going to be chlorine in my water um, and that could potentially uh, slow the fermentation process, change it in some way. I have actually not typically found that to be the case. And 
I don't like to require people to do one more step, one more additional step, having to go purchase water. Um, so I typically just use tap water wherever I am. So give tap water a try. Um, if you are concerned about chlorine or if you discover, or if you're having you know, failures, you can go ahead and you know, let the water air and that will let some of the chlorine out, et cetera. So for one quart of water, I've got one tablespoon, I mean, sorry, a tablespoon and a half. So one quart of water, one and a half tablespoons of salt. The salt that I'm using here is canning and pickling salt, which is entirely, all it is is salt. It's pure salt, so nothing has been added to it. So no caking, anti-caking agents, um, no iodine. So if at all possible, steer clear from any kind of iodized salt or salt that has caking agents in it. The iodine can change flavors um, and fermentation rates and things like that. Sometimes it doesn't as well. So, but that can happen with iodized salt and the caking agents can kind of change the quality. It'll be more cloudy. Um, so neither of them is a, a food safety issue. It's entirely a quality issue. So it is best to try to use as pure salt as possible. Uh, sea salt is great. Um, I know down here in Southeast, we have um, some great products like out of Sitka, we've got Alaska Pure Sea Salt. Um, and those are going to have minerals in them. Minerals could also potentially change flavors, change fermentation, but not by a whole lot typically. So try the salt you have. And frankly, if all you have is table salt and you don't wanna buy something new, go ahead and give that a try, see if it works. Another thing that uh, goes on with salt is that you get different grain sizes. So typically uh, pickling recipes, they rely on canning and pickling salt, which has a specific grain size, which means there's a certain amount of sodium per tablespoon. And if you get a much finer salt, you'll end up with more, you know, so, so there's things like that as well to think about. Um, and uh, uh, fermentation is not ever outside of a lab or very specialized circumstances is not ever going to be a low sodium product. So that's something to consider. You can try reducing the salt when you ferment, you know, try it a couple times and each time reduce the salt a little bit. Um, but there's going to be a point at which you're basically creating an environment that's going to let yeasts and molds move in and you're going to spoil your food because you don't have high enough salinity to keep those out. So, but you can try it. Another thing that you can do for low sodium diets is you can, or if it just tastes more salty than you like, uh, you can actually rinse it. There will still be probiotics in there, but you'll get rid of some of that surface salt. So I am going to add these one and a half tablespoons of canning and pickling salt to this water. I'm just gonna sort of shake it up while I'm talking. Um, I want this to dissolve. And I noticed I did not get all of the salt in there. Come on, there we go. I'm gonna let this dissolve. Hopefully I have time for it to get clear. This is just sort of room temperature water. I'm gonna let this dissolve. Then I am going to do, um, I'm doing asparagus. And I know that even within my family, there is something of a feud over the best way to prepare your asparagus. My husband is of the snap um, uh, team. I am of the, that is very tedious. And I am going to cut team wherever you're at on that, you stay there. Do what you like to do. And then combos that you can. All right, so I've got rid of the very woody ends. And um, when you are pickling anything, you want to, I, I think I've mentioned this phrase before, edit the guest list. So I found one of these that is already turning. And so it's actually already got some bacteria and, or you know other microorganisms that are starting to spoil this. So I'm gonna get rid of this one because I don't want that one in there. The rest of these actually look really pretty good. There's no sliminess, there's no discoloration, et cetera. And I want these to be pretty much bite-sized. So I'm going to cut them in bite size right now before I ferment them. You can also 
do them as spears. This, the uh, sort of the shape and size of the vegetable doesn't matter except it is a good idea to try to keep them somewhat consistent so that they will ferment at the same rate. Um, again, that's, oops, let me shake this up a little bit better. Um, uh, sometimes if you're doing a mixed pickle, you need to be a little bit aware of the rates of fermentation for different vegetables. Cauliflower takes a little bit longer than um, say red peppers. So a lot of times what I will do if I'm mixing those, I will actually layer them. I'll put cauliflower on the bottom of the jar and then the red peppers will be on the top. They lend each other their flavors, but the red peppers will actually be fermented to a, a state that I like a little bit quicker. And so that's something, or you can, you know, cut the cauliflower much smaller and the, the red pepper much bigger. You can, you know, experiment that way as well. All right, so here's my brine. All I'm going to do is I am going to place my, so these are just washed jars. Um, again, there are folks who would say that you should sterilize, um, but I typically don't, and, and I actually took some classes from, from some folks who are really, quite at the guru level of fermentation. And they actually recommend not necessarily sterilizing unless you know that there is some issue um, because, uh, because you actually, you're using natural uh, biology that's going on in and around these vegetables and you actually want to use that. You don't want dirt, you know? So um, having some microorganisms already in the mix is not a bad thing on the glass. So I've just filled this to about three, uh, it's a little more than half, two thirds full. That's just because that's how much there was in the asparagus, in the batch of asparagus. Um, I would typically try to go maybe to just below the shoulder on this particular jar. You want to leave a fair bit of room at the top because what I'm gonna do next, let's see if I have my candy funnel. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to add this brine, and yep, it's all nicely dissolved. I'm going to add this brine, and I'm just going to cover the asparagus. So you want them to be completely covered. So that's why you do need some room at the top. You want them to be covered by about an inch. One thing that I will do, okay, I'm going to use my hands because I happen to know that my mother used to call them my little monkey hands because I can fit them in these jars. And I'm just gonna check to see when I press it down, is there a good full inch above it? And yes, the answer is yes. But you'll notice the silly things float. When you're fermenting, the goal is to keep all the vegetables under the brine. Keeping them salty is what's going to protect them from any unwanted microorganisms. So how do you keep them under the brine? There's different ways you can do that. You will see products that you can use. Um, there's a, a company that has pickle pebbles. I might have one over there where it's like a, a heavy glass disc that you can put down inside of a mason jar and that holds them down. One really easy way to do it though, you'll see I have extra brine. That was on purpose. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a plastic bag. Get it closer, see if you can see it. I'm going to put the plastic bag and kind of spread it. This is just a quart sized plastic bag. And it, you know, use whatever quality of plastic in terms of thickness of plastic bag you want. I happen to have freezer quality here. And then you actually fill it with brine. And what that does is the weight of the brine pushes the vegetables down. So the brine actually is now above all of the vegetables but it also spreads out and creates like a gasket. So it keeps dust and things from the air coming in because those things, off, of course, they come with microorganisms, but they also you know, can feed microorganisms that you don't want. So you could get um, some growth of yeasts and molds on the top if you don't keep them completely submerged in brine. And it's nice to have that gasket. So what I do then, is I just get rid of any extra air in there, ziplock it, closed. Easier said than done, geez, come on now. All right, and then I just, well, one thing, if it's just here, I just leave it like this. 
And I'll usually put a little plate under it so that, um, you know, if, if, so one of the things that I will do, I like to use glass. So containers that you can use for fermenting, uh, glass is terrific, food safe um, plastic is uh, food quality plastic is good. And of course, we all know about, you know, the, the traditional like sauerkraut fermentation crocks. If you um, are looking for or have what you think is a fermentation crock, make sure that you see a mark on it that the, that the glaze is lead free. There are quite a lot of decorative crocks out there that aren't intended for food use. And there's lead in the glaze and you wanna make sure that you aren't using one of those. I like glass because I can see what's going on because I just leave this on the counter right over there that where a place where you can't see. Um, it's out of direct sunlight. Sunlight will heat up the glass, you know, or whatever container it's in. So you don't want to heat that up and create, you know, uh, temperature fluctuations. You want it to stay. I usually give a pretty big range, 65 to 75, but really it does kind of like it to be a little closer to the like 68 to 72 kind of range. But that's, you know, we do sometimes uh, run our houses cold. If that's the case, you can look for a slightly warmer place like above the refrigerator. I don't typically recommend um, the boiler room if you are using a fuel burning because you can actually get those tastes into your pickles if there's any kind of sort of fuel smell. So you can find a slightly warmer place in your home if you need to. If you run your house hot, then, you know, or you are in a, or you're in Fairbanks and it's getting up to 80 or 90 or something like that, you wanna to try to find maybe a slightly cooler place um, in the house if that's possible. What will happen if it's a little bit too cold, it'll ferment slowly. If it's a little bit too warm, uh, it will ferment quicker. And you can just have the processes happen quicker and therefore it can actually spoil kind of before you expect it or things like that. So right in that temperature range is good. But one thing that you wanna do while it's fermenting is um, periodically look and see if there's any white film that is uh, developing on the edge of the plastic bag. If you can see a little bit of the surface of the brine, if there's any white there, if there's any white on the uh, jar, you wanna remove this. And that's why I keep a, a plate underneath it because salt water can get on some surfaces and can corrode it or just leave marks and stuff. So then if there was white on this, I would just go to the sink and I rinse it off. I keep it closed, rinse it off. I take a paper towel, I, I wipe whatever I could reach of the white film there, and then I just put it back. Uh, that white film is kind of like a, a pre-mold. You know, it's the very first start of potentially molding. And so you wanna get rid of that so you stop that process. This uh, size jar, I will probably, um, keep this on the counter for two to three weeks. If you are new to it, what you want to do is you want to start tasting it. Perfectly safe to taste it. This is a very safe food preservation process because of that salt and then, uh, and then eventually because of the acid. You can start tasting this. I This size, I would recommend someone to start tasting it at about a week. There will likely be a point during that first week or first two weeks when it gets kind of stinky. It's a, it's a smell that we don't associate with a happy kitchen necessarily. It's fine. It will move through that. That's just one of the stages of fermentation happens to be. There's several different uh, bacteria that are sort of a cascade from one to the next to the next. And there's one in there that we don't like the smell of so well. So you get past that. But really knowing whether your fermented pickles are done is the taste. You taste it, once you like the taste, you take that bag out. I recommend putting a plastic lid on uh, and of course, if you're you you can reuse pickle jars. You can use all kinds. You don't have to use canning jars. I just have so many of them. But I usually like to use the non-metal lid because the metal lids will corrode and then sometimes stick to the jar and be hard to get off. So when these are done, I will put this plastic lid on and I'll put it in the fridge, and it'll stay there. And we will eat off of it. You know, something this size. It might be maybe a month or two weeks or something, depending. Um, so that's how you make fermented 
pitfalls. I'm going to put this back in because I'm going to let these do their thing over the next couple of weeks. Um, one thing to remember, the probiotics will, more probiotics will develop the longer you ferment. So over time, when you get more familiar with the process and more comfortable with it, Go ahead and, you know, taste it, but then maybe let it go another day and then taste it again and let it go a little bit longer. You might discover that the flavors that develop, you like them better. It gets even more tangy or whatever it might be. Um, another thing, kind of going back to the preserving herbs from last week is um, you can ferment herbs with the vegetables through the fermentation process or you can just do a straight fermentation and add herbs later, herbs and spices later. If you add them during the fermentation process, they of course will change the flavors. That might be terrific. But if you're expecting a sort of a specific herb flavor, um, it tends to be better to add those later, just before you're gonna put them in the fridge and maybe let them sit with those herbs for a little bit. So I know we're coming right up on time. I'd like to see if anybody has any questions um, or did I confuse anybody or if there's any specific vegetable or pickle that people are interested in. So I'm going to ask, um, so I've made pickles with, in vinegar where you, you don't really leave it on the counter. You just do it and then you put it in the fridge. Right. Yeah, that's, you can do that's, that. that's terrific. You can do that because it's high acid because of the vinegar. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. Yep, it's instant acid as opposed to sit and wait for it acid. Okay, Char asked, what about cabbage? Do you have cabbage, yes, so cabbage is of course, the classic for those of us who are clearly from northern climes in in uh, originally in Europe, so sauerkraut and um, and or and then of course kimchi from the other side of the world. Um, so cabbage, you can do it just like this, or there is actually a specific process for sauerkraut uh, because the cabbage actually has a fair amount of liquid in it you can actually just do salt and it will create its own brine. So a ratio for that is three tablespoons of pickling salt to five pounds of vegetable. So if you have a leafy vegetable, which is all the different types of cabbage, you can try kale, you can try other leafy things as well. You'll discover what does well and what doesn't. The firmer uh, leaves tend to do better because they last, they, they do better in the fermentation process. But what you do is you just add that salt to the cabbage, you mix it up and over the course of a day or so, you press it down, you keep sort of, you, you, um, you can massage it if you want, that breaks down the cell walls, releases uh, the liquid and it actually creates its own brine which is great. But that's really the biggest difference between cabbage and this. You can also just chop up some cabbage, put them in here. That's uh, one of the ways that you can make kimchi. You're chopping up a uh, Napa cabbage, you're putting spices in with it as well. You're putting maybe radish in it. It's a specific blend of vegetables, pretty much the same process. Anything else? So Sarah, in the handouts that you're gonna give us, um, are there, can you talk about like what the red, what's in the handouts and the recipes? Sure. I will be sending um, a bunch of different recipes. I have different sort of handouts that I offer to different workshops and things like that. Um, so you'll get some recipe handouts. I will also uh, attach um, links to the websites and the resources that I've mentioned, as well as our actual uh, publications, ex free extension publications. We have a making sauerkraut publication. Um, uh, and then we have a pickling public. So I'll, I'll add links to all of those. Um, so yeah, so actual documents as well as links to other resources. Great. And just, just a reminder that that will go out in an email, a follow-up email with a link to the recording of today's uh, webinar and all the handouts to everyone who registered. Thank you so much for doing that. All right. We do have just a few things here. Um, 
to follow up on. There we go. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for participating in today's program. We hope you found the session helpful. Please let us know how you like the program. Please put any ideas for upcoming webinars in the chat. We would like to thank our partners at the Alaska Cooperative Extension Service for helping us host these events for you. Um, if you found this useful, you may want to sign up for other programs in our Fall Harvest series. You can find our events at www.aarp.org, AK, and you can always contact us on our website. So thank you so very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Great. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.